Hello and welcome back. I'm Sarah Mueller, a reporter with Forbes, and today I'm joined by Iowa State Senator Pam Yoakum. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure, Sarah. It's uh, it's just great to be here with you today. We have quite a bit to cover because not only is there a lot happening on the national scale, but we have a lot going on here in Iowa too. So I want to cover some of the Des Moines Register's Iowa poll that came out in September, just so our audience knows where we stand. So Trump is barely leading by 47% with Kamala at 43%, which is a huge uh, margin in or decrease since Kamala entered the race because uh, it was actually double digits when Biden was still in the race. So let's just first look at that data. What do you think uh, of the current standings in the race? Oh, well, first of all, let me just say that, in my opinion, the Iowa poll over the last 10 years has probably been the most accurate of all the polling that I have seen, even at the national level. They have been on the mark on a number of races in this state. So when I see an Iowa poll come out and shows that Kamala Harris was within the margin of error in Iowa, I go, amen, hallelujah, we're back in the game. And I believe we are. I think Iowa Democrats are back. And I, I have not seen this level of energy and enthusiasm and hope uh, since, since President Obama's campaign in 2008. And no matter where I have traveled, and believe me, I've traveled over 33,000 miles in Iowa in the past year, I can tell you that energy level and enthusiasm is just unbelievably wo just warming my heart every day, believe me. I mean, we've gone, we've had a couple of years now where Trump has won here in Iowa. Do you think that there is a chance that Harris can turn Iowa to her side? I actually do. And I believe that because of the level of enthusiasm and hope. I've not seen Democrats as energized to hit the streets as I have in the last few months. And I can tell you that even our Iowa Senate Democratic hands, there's 21 that we have recruited out of the 25 seats, they have already hit the doors of 108,000, 108,000 persuadable voters. And it is truly breaking our way, like 51% Democrat, 7% Dem uh, Republican, and then about 40% are still undecided. The rest are supporting someone other. So that numbers in themselves among persuadable voters gives me tremendous hope and confidence that we are headed in the right direction and that Kamala does truly have a chance here in Iowa. And it does help, as you mentioned, to have Tim Waltz, I always call him the happy warrior from Minnesota, on that ticket with her because a lot of us know Tim and love him dearly. Well, let's quickly look at kind of these issues that Iowans care about. We've got about two weeks until this election happens. I mean, it feels like it's been so long and here we come last stretch. So what does Kamala Harris need to do to really close that gap here in the next couple of weeks? You know, what I'm hearing from Iowans is that they really are tired of the chaos, the bullying, the hateful uh, words and comments that 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 that, that, that President, former President Trump continues to use, and they really want democracy back. They want decency back. They want uh, someone like a Kamala Harris who has empathy, who is honest, and who is a decent human being. And that's what Iowans are looking for. We've always been Iowa nice. Well. It's become more Iowa mean in the last few years, and that's not who and what we are. As I have traveled, uh, and I truly have done town hall listening posts, I have done labor roundtables, I've spoken at dozens and dozens of different meetings, and everyone will say the same thing. Same question is posed. What the heck happened? What happened to our state? I no longer recognize the state I love. And this governor has really promoted and implemented much of Donald Trump's Project 2025. So I say, Kamala Harris, keep showing who you are. People are looking for a person to be our president who has decency, who has character, who is honest, and who has our best interests at heart. And of course, people are, are, are concerned about those pocketbook issues. And they're even more concerned right now, even about their freedoms and the freedom to make their own health care decision, the opportunity for their children to have a really great public education in Iowa and a chance to be able to earn a living wage 
with secure retirement and some benefits. So those are the issues that we continue to hear over and over again. And it's not different than what we are hearing at the national level. Kamala is right on the issues and democracy is on the ballot and the character of this country and our state is on the ballot and people are waking up to it and saying we've had enough. We want it. We want balance back in our country and in our state. I think one of the issues we hear reoccurring that voters might be on the fence about with Kamala Harris is that obviously she served in Biden's administration. How is this going to be different from a Biden administration? And I think a lot of those voters are looking at those key issues like the economy, um, like, you know, international affairs and, and global security. So can you talk a little bit about how you think you believe her issues are maybe she's going to handle them different than Joe Biden did? Sure. I think she's already outlined some of those differences already. Um, she's walking that fine line because she, she has tremendous respect for Joe Biden. And quite frankly, the Biden-Harris administration really pulled this nation off the brink of a recession. I always call it the Trump COVID recession. And I'm sure some of your listeners may not like hearing that. But that's how I looked at it coming off of this pandemic they really were dealt a really difficult hand in terms of the economy and dealing with a, a pandemic all at the same time. And I believe what they have done in investing in our communities and our country on infrastructure and some of those very important issues has really, um, actually has been more than what we even saw FDR do back during the great, the, the New Deal. And has really put a lot of people back to work and sort of addressing some of our critical infrastructure needs that have been, that have been ignored for many years years. So I think she those kinds of issues to me are issues she needs to continue to campaign on and at the same time show what she would do somewhat different. I will say that um, overall Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have done a really good job on the international stage of pulling our allies back together and working well together again and, and really trying to focus on what we can do to ensure Ukraine rem remains a free country and doesn't fall into the hands of Putin and, and all of those kinds of issues, including what's going on in Israel with Hamas. What a mess. But uh, I think she's working through that. I think she's done a pretty good job of talking to the American people about where she's at on that issue. And I just... I couldn't ask for someone stronger or better than Kamala Harris to lead our party and our nation um, for the next four years, hopefully eight. We have some local elections here that are actually pretty tight as we come up to this uh, election deadline. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to quickly address that um, we do have obviously a full GOP uh, Congress and uh, Senate right now for, for the U.S. Senate and the U.S. Uh, House. So all of those seats are red. How is the, how is that going to be impacted if Donald Trump does win this election? Do you think it could hit the rest of the ballot? Um, actually, you know what? What's really interesting, that's, that's a great question, Sarah. And, and here's what, how I'm going to start by answering it. I have done uh, quite a bit of research over the years. And quite frankly, I, I have served in public office for 32 years now between the House and the Senate in the Iowa legislature and served as president of the Senate, now minority leader in the Senate. But anyway, what we have done that is somewhat different is that we have become, we have launched a much more aggressive ground campaign, uh, more aggressive than I've seen in Iowa for the past probably three to four election cycles. The second thing I want to mention is that I have, I personally have always outperformed the top of the ticket anywhere from, uh, anywhere from, from a half a point to, excuse me, a half a point to uh, uh, 10 points, depending on, on what race it is. And and uh, I can tell you that down ballot candidates running for the state house and for the courthouse often will all perform the top of the ticket. So the better we do, be, and this is why, because at the local level, we're the ones out knocking the doors, going to the community events, uh, meeting people where they're at. So, so people in our district get to know us in a way that they'll never get to know uh, a candidate running for Congress or running for president. And so therefore we help push turnout. So regardless, I believe they'll make tremendous headway in uh, moving forward uh, regardless, but I believe we're gonna help push turnout and make it work much better.
Let's talk a little bit about Tim Walls. Obviously, he's our neighbor. Obviously, I know, as even an Iowan, I know about his leadership uh, just as a fellow Midwesterner. Tell a little bit, maybe to the rest of the country, uh, how that might impact Iowans voting uh, to have another Midwesterner on the ticket. Well, I thought it was a great choice for that very reason. It's called Midwest, just common sense. And I think that Tim has shown over and over again uh, that he is a very humble man, a humble leader, and that he has really done some fabulous good things in the state of Minnesota as, as their governor and, of course, previously as their member of Congress. But he has really focused on making sure that Minnesota children receive the best uh, education possible. He wants to make sure that every child has a chance to be nurtured, and whether that would be to address food insecurity, uh, making sure that families are able to have feel safe that their children are well cared for in childcare, all those issues that really affect uh, working people's everyday life. And he, he and the, uh, the, the state legislature in Minnesota have done a really good job of addressing the really essential needs of, uh, of their working families. So he will be there for us and he will have our back. Let's switch gears back to Iowa. We have some close races for our U.S. House seats. All of them are currently red. Um, we are currently looking at, uh, just here in Des Moines, we have Zach Nunn up against Lenon Bacom. Are, that's kind of the race standing out to me. Again, that's also my district. But are there any races specifically here in Iowa that you're keeping a very close eye on? Um, sure. Le Lenon Bacom's race is one of them. The other one, of course, is Christina Bohannon in Congressional District 1. And that's currently held by uh, Marionette Miller Meeks. I can tell you that both Lenon Bacom and, and Christina Bohannon have launched a very uh, aggressive ground campaign in addition to being able to raise the kind of funding they need to effectively communicate to their constituents uh, what, what they stand for and what they would do if elected. At the same time, I will tell you that both the House and Senate Democrats and the legislature have made it one of our goals to make sure that we had recruited candidates to run for the House and Senate uh, legislative seats in the first and third district because we believe so strongly that those down ballot races make such an impact on helping to push voter turnout that in turn helps the top of the ticket. It's vice versa at times too, I get it, it's up and down, but there's tremendous interplay between local races and the top of the ticket. So all of that comes together and, and that's why we made a real concerted effort to make sure that we had cans recruited to run in all of those seats that were in the running for the state legislature in Congressional One and Three, I feel very hopeful. The polling I have seen that uh, that has been out has shown that both Lana McCom and Christina Bohannon are within the margin of error, and they got a slight lead, but they're within the margin of error. We're seeing something similar in. Um, some of our target legislative races where our candidates have a, have a lead within the margin of error, but I'd rather be where we are than the other way around. So we are not letting our foot off the gas here. We're going to keep on going uh, for the next two weeks as strong as we can. And we're going to just hopefully we're going to get there and we're going to get over that finish line. Before I let you go, even though Kim Reynolds is not up for re-election this election, I do want to talk about how her lieutenant governor uh, has stepped down and just her current actions, kind of if you have any reflection on recent events around the governor's office. Obviously, she supported uh, Governor Ron DeSantis for president. Uh, she's been relatively quiet since uh, he dropped out of the race. But do you have any kind of input about what's going on with the governor's office, especially since uh, the lieutenant governor has stepped down? So she has certainly announced that she won't be making a, an announcement on who her, her pick is or selection is for a lieutenant governor till after the election. Some of us have speculated that she was waiting to see who wins and loses and perhaps will select one of those who aren't successful uh, in this coming election cycle. Who knows? I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not on her inner sanctum. But, we'll, but what, what I will say about Governor Reynolds and about the State House Republicans is that as I have traveled those 33,000 miles and held those town hall listening sessions, 
uh, the, the issues that continue to pop up over and over again is how dissatisfied Iowans are with Kim Reynolds and the State House Republicans on a number of issues. The six week abortion ban, gone too far on the vouchers, gone too far, disrupting our public education system, public money should be used for public schools, book bans, it goes on and on. And I can tell you, people are very angry right now about what she has done. In my humble opinion, she's already implementing Project 2025 in Iowa and has been since she got it to collect a bargaining law back in 2017. So we're already living through uh, some of the results and consequences of Donald Trump's Project 2025. I guess I could call it Kim Reynolds Project 2025 because we're already living through some of it and Iowans don't like what they're seeing and what they're getting. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your insights and we hope you join us next time. I would love to do that, Sarah. Thank you so much for inviting me and you have a fabulous day.